Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our program on Key Nutritional Questions for Pet Owners with Dr. Travis Atkins, the co-founder of Square Pet Nutrition. My name is Greg Boyer, and I have the pleasure of working in the operations team for Cherry Brook Pet Supplies. Travis is a licensed veterinarian and a member of the American Academic Veterinarian Nutrition. After graduating from the University of California, Davis, Travis started a pet food distribution business that catered to independent food stores. He returned to the University of California, Davis, and earned his doctorate of veterinary medicine degree and worked in family practice and emergency medicine before co-founding Square Pet Nutrition. Cherry Brook believes that education is critical for pet owners to make informed decisions about nutrition, so we're pleased to bring informative programs like this to you. Using the chat box on the right side of your screen, please share with us what kind of pets your family has and what states you're checking in from. And I'll start off by saying I'm from New Jersey and I recently adopted a new Great Dane puppy. How about you, Travis? What kind of pet do you have? Oh, we, I have a, a Labrador named BB uh, that we, as kind of a, we jokingly and lovingly say that it's a, a used dog or she's a used dog. Uh, it was a really sweet dog. That was a rehome situation, but a uh, uh, great little dog. All right. It looks like Claudia from New Jersey has a Samoya. No, she has three Samoyas. And Gretchen from PA has a Whippet. And wow, we got a lot of attendees tonight. So Amy from Westfield has a Beagle. And Kathy from Colorado has two Labradoodles. And wow, there are a lot of people who are joining us tonight. So well, thank you so much, guys. We want to show you how to use the chat bar here. Because uh, if you have a question or you'd like to submit a comment, you can feel free to use the chat bar here to submit your questions and comments. And we'll be fielding questions throughout the presentation and definitely at the conclusion of the webinar tonight. At that, Travis, all yours. I appreciate it, Greg. And uh, just want to say before we get started, thank you to Cherry Brook for uh, having me on, uh, inviting Square Pet to uh, do this presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, kind of the goal for, for this evening, uh, you know, we talked about certain, certain topics to discuss. And instead of sailing on one, one topic, we thought it'd be neat to kind of identify a few different topics that uh, maybe are myths in the pet food industry or or just commonly ask questions and kind of bounce around and, and maybe make it a little more fun and entertaining. Uh, appreciate the, the uh, introduction, Greg. Uh, I am a, a legitimate dog and cat repairman. I kind of like to jokingly say, uh, but just a real quick tidbit, you know, I had the, uh, I think the fortunate experience of, of garnering a lot of, of pet food experience uh, as a as a kid before I, I, I joined into the, the, the ranks of the veterinary world. And that's allowed me to kind of have a different perspective when it comes to, to pet food nutrition and the pet food in, uh, industry in, in general. I, I, I have the ability to kind of look at it from both sides of the coin, from the veterinary side and also from, from the industry side as well. And that's really uh, helped Square Pet and helped myself to get a get, really get a better understanding of what, what it is people like and, and, and truly what they care about. And, and really what it comes down to is, is doing the best thing for their, for their pets. Um, just real quick, you know, what is Square or who is Square Pet? Uh, we're, we're a relatively new new company, uh, but we are a family business, 100% family owned, uh, comprised of, of three primary individuals, myself, my, my brother, Tyler, who is uh, in charge of our marketing department, uh, as well as my dad, Peter, who's the CEO. And uh, we all have a, a long, expansive history within the pet food industry as a result of, of my dad's career uh, when we were when we were kids. Uh, but really what we feel separates Square Pet away from maybe some of the other pet food manufacturers that are around these days. And there's a lot of great brands doing a lot of great things and using a lot of great ingredients. Uh, what we feel that separates Square Pet is, is that we promote nutrition with a purpose. And what that really means is that with every diet that we create, uh, we feel that there's a benefit in front of the features um, in the sense of, there's other brands that are using really great sourced ingredients, high quality ingredients, and those are the features of, of the food itself. And we like to take it a step further and use those quality ingredients, but then also combine them in a way to promote the nutrition and how can this benefit your pet versus just promoting the features. Each one of our diets is, is veterinary and formulated. Uh, it's not just myself. I work with a team of, of uh, really smart people with a lot of letters behind their behind their name and uh, uh, including a board certified veterinary nutritionist. This isn't something that we take actually really, really seriously to, to develop these, these products in a, in a responsible and, and efficient way. Uh, 
it, just to kind of touch on one of our most uh, of a product line that's garnering the most attention right now is our VFS product line. It's the first of its kind. Uh, we like to call it solutions-based nutrition, essentially targeting certain um, uh, therapeutic diets, if you will, uh, but just to tackling them in a, in a different way using higher quality ingredients that are consistent with the uh, Square Pet nutritional philosophy. So with that, before we kind of dive in there, uh, I mentioned I have a dog named BB. She's a black lab and uh, she had a play date with her buddy Tex that lives in, in our neighborhood. And uh, they came over, we left them alone for a couple of hours. And and this is this is what the, we came back to. And I was really nervous at first that uh, she had gotten or they had gotten into the couch cushions. But luckily, it was just a, uh, a, a dog bed. So uh, not that big a deal. Uh, so the, tonight we just have a series of seven questions and with each one of these we're going to kind of ask for some audience participation and uh, get that poll started. Uh, so the first one that we're going to have tonight is do prescription diets contain drugs or medications? So feel free to answer the question on the right hand side there. According to the poll results, uh, about three quarters of our audience believe no, that they do not contain uh, drugs or medications, but about 25% are unsure. Great. You know, that's that's a, a really great answer. We've got a really great audience. Um, that's the answer. Uh, drugs are not a part of, of prescription diets. They do not contain any kind of controlled substances or any kind of medications. And that's sometimes a, a, a misconception that, that these therapeutic diets do contain uh, drugs and medications because they're carrying around the term prescription diets one would think uh, that they did contain that and i think that that sometimes even as veterinarians uh, these therapeutic diets maybe get put up on a on a pedestal in the sense that uh, that they maybe contain some some kind of some type of ingredients that other manufacturers can't achieve or don't have access to and that's really not the case uh, they're they're really well designed diets but what they're doing is hitting certain nutritional targets just using common ingredients. Um, and what I have here is, is just a couple of examples of what I'm what I'm talking about. So if we play out a couple of scenarios, let's presume that we have a dog that has some loose stool, has an upset stomach, has uh, had a rough time at the dog park, land diet, so to speak. And so the solution that we're looking for is some type of digestive support. And so there's all kinds of digestive support diets out there. Uh, the nutritional target for that uh, digestive support diet is really to be highly digestible, easy on the tummy, uh, and then also paying attention to the balance of fiber in there. Uh, and then the, the ingredients that we use or the, the, the method that we use to achieve that nutritional target are just your everyday common ingredients. And this is typically what you would find in the existing diets that are out there. And, and again, I mentioned our BFS diets. Uh, this is kind of what uh, the direction we're headed with with those is to hit those same nutritional targets, but just using different, uh, maybe we'll presume, premium uh, ingredients to hit those same nutritional targets. And so if we take another example, let's say a dog has pancreatitis or a dog is in need of a low fat diet uh, to manage some type of IBD condition, uh, what we're has guaranteed lower amounts of fat, so it won't exceed a certain fat content. And again, really pretty simple. We're looking for something that's highly digestible and low in fat. As a little side note, I am kind of oversimplifying this to some degree. There are a lot of micronutrients. There are things like uh, omega-3 fatty acids and antioxidants and some other minor things that, that we need to pay attention to when talking about these diets. But for the most part, we're looking for a highly digestible diet that's, that's low in fat. And this is typically what you'll find out there in, in uh, the existing diets. And you know, as an example, our, our low fat formula, we, we chose to use uh, MSC certified sustainable Pacific cod and, and ocean white fish meal. They're, they're really great high quality protein ingredients that aren't carrying a whole lot of fat with them and, and really a great fit for, for a low fat formula. Uh, when we look at, say, let's say joint disease, and this is the last one, I'm not going to carry this on forever, uh, but we're looking for a joint support diet. So maybe we have an older dog that's that's limping around or maybe even a younger dog that we're looking to proactively uh, maybe stay off joint disease as they get older. 
what we're looking for is is a weight control uh, diet that also combines chondroprotective ingredients, so uh, chondroprotective joint protective ingredients. You know, having a, a, a diet that helps manage weight maintenance um, is a is a really important thing when it comes to to joint disease. Uh, that's the best thing that we can do. That's the number one medication, if you will, to to help. Uh, 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 alleviate some of the distress that dogs are going through when, when they have joint disease. Um, and so those chondroprotective ingredients, we're familiar with glucosamine and chondroitin, omega-3, DHA, EPA, uh, for their anti-inflammatory properties. And again, just an example of, of just some differing uh, philosophies on how we can arrive at the very similar nutritional targets. You know, for instance, we're using New Zealand green lip muscle and eggshell membrane collagen to derive the majority of our glucosamine and chondroitin, really great natural sources of bioavailable glucosamine and chondroitin. So uh, in summary, uh, you all nailed it. 75% uh, of the crowd uh, said no, and uh, they're absolutely correct. We're just using, uh, we're, we have nutritional targets that we're trying to achieve, and we use everyday ingredients to, to get there. So uh, with that, this is BB again. Uh, I have a presumption that the mo majority of our audience might be visiting us tonight from the Northeast. So the concept of snow is, is fairly trivial, but for myself living in Texas and for a dog that's never seen snow before, it was, it was really cool. This is uh, BB's first experience of, of actually seeing this white stuff falling from the sky and uh, it was starting to, to collect on top of the trampoline. That's why we put her up there, but uh, she enjoys being on top. She jumps on the, on there all the time with her, with our kids, but, uh, Texas dog with her first snow. Okay. Question number two, does meat as the first ingredient make a diet high in protein? So according to this, about two thirds of our audience say it depends on the formula and one third say no, no one believes yes. Okay, again, a great, great assessment by, by our audience. It, it is uh, a little bit of a tricky question in the sense of um, it, it's focused on whether a diet's high in protein or not. This is uh, not to dissuade from having meat as the first ingredient. I think we're all proponents of having meat as the first ingredient. Uh, but just the fact that it has meat as a number one ingredient, does that make it high in protein? And the overwhelming majority of cases is no. Um, and when you look around at the landscape of a lot of different brands, uh, they're promoting this. Uh, you know, meat, real meat is the as the first ingredient. It didn't take me long to come across these five different uh, call outs for these different brands. And, and again, I am a hundred percent in favor of this. This is a, this is a positive thing. This is just more to, to kind of uh, point out a few nuances with meat as the first ingredient. Um, and so what I did, I just grabbed a random ingredient panel here it has salmon as the, as the number one ingredient. Uh, but when we look at fresh meats as the first ingredient, uh, we have to remember that the majority of, of all meats, have more uh, overwhelming percentage or 75% thereof of, of water. Um, and so when we look at the way that ingredients are ranked uh, on the ingredient panel, they're ranked by weight, you know, highest amount of, of uh, highest weight, it gets the highest uh, position on the ingredient panel. And so if we make an assumption that each one of these three, first three ingredients weighs one pound, um, then we assume, and this is before cooking, um, but then after we cook, uh, we lose a good chunk of that. You know, one pound of salmon essentially turns into a quarter pound of, of salmon. So that's not contributing a whole lot of, of protein to the overall diet. And it essentially makes uh, the second and third ingredient uh, the main drivers of, of, the, of either the protein nutrition or the overall nutrition within the, within the diet. So what I've done is just real quickly, we got kind of three different diets and just kind of talk about each one of them. The one on the left, we have a, a lower protein diet that's around 20% protein. Uh, we've got lamb, lamb meal is the first two ingredients. You think, maybe, oh, maybe this, is, this could be a, a moderate protein diet. Uh, but then we look at, it's got about four or five different carbohydrate-based ingredients. And so uh, we know for, you know, we, our presumption is that this isn't gonna be a really high protein diet just with that amount of carbohydrate-based ingredients in there. Uh, and so we turn our attention to the, the second one, and quite frankly, they look very similar. 
Um, and we're wondering, well, why, how come this one's 30% and the other one's 20%? And what's, what's to be noted, not to say that it's a bad thing at all, but uh, we, what we'll find in a lot of diets these days are, are vegetable-based proteins or concentrated vegetable uh, protein sources. And so that's essentially what's driving a lot of the protein that's in this particular diet, even though it is leading with the meat-based protein, not saying there's anything wrong with it at all, but uh, really just pointing out the differentiation between the, the diets one and two. And then I think diet number three on the on the right-hand side is kind of a layup. You know, we look at, you know, they have two, two fresh, fresh meat ingredients, but then we're following with a ton of animal-based ingredients after that. So it's going to be a, a really high-protein uh, diet. And so that's the key uh, is when we look at meat first, it's a great thing. Uh, we just have to look at the trailing ingredients behind it. And so with B, uh, she really loved the, the snow, and uh, uh, we got bombarded with a couple of weeks of of lockdown type snow here in Texas and it really shut things down and it didn't seem to bother her at all because we were home all the time and she got to go on a lot of walks. Okay, so question number three uh, for the poll, do high protein diets cause kidney disease? Okay, so it looks like about two thirds of the audience say no, uh, about 22% say not sure, and 10% of the time they say sometimes. Okay, again, kind of a, a, a great audience. I'm in, I'm in agreement. Uh, for the most part, actually, for the most part, I'm in agreement, but the answer to the question is no. And I thought about how um, I can answer this question, and I figured out the, the best way to do it is not to take my word for it, but let's just pull up. Uh, a handful of studies. This is something that's been studied quite a bit. And really the, the end result with all these studies is that uh, protein does not adversely affect the kidneys. Uh, so said another way, uh, you can feed high protein diets to both dogs and cats, and there is no uh, great concern of inciting or causing any kind of kidney issues at all. Uh, Looking at this study here, they actually took dogs that had, had compromised kid kidneys. Uh, they only had about a quarter of their kidney function left, fed them high protein diets. At the end of the study, I'm gonna say it was for four years. Um, at the end of that four years, there was no change in, in the, the renal function or the kidney function of, the, of these diets fed, fed high protein diets. Uh, just to throw in our, our little kitty cat friends here, uh, again, same, same results. High protein diets don't cause kidney disease in cats. Uh, I think it intuitively makes sense to the majority of us. Cats are obligate carnivores. They are, do a tremendous job at converting those proteins and fats into usable amounts of energy. Uh, just completely meat driven, protein driven uh, carnivores. Uh, what I like to highlight with, with high protein diets is in, in, in combination with low carbohydrates, not just high protein, but low carbohydrate, is how they can be used to promote weight loss or even promote weight maintenance. And that's a huge distinction that I found clinically um, in contrast to high meat, low carbohydrate weight loss diets out there that have uh, their lower, lower caloric density, so they don't have a lot of energy per cup. Uh, they also have higher fiber amounts, and, and really they're, they're quite carbohydrate laden. And for some people, some folks have really tremendous success with them. I personally never had that great a success using those diets. And the reason being is that the dogs that, that placed on them, they seemed like they were starving all the time and they could never feel full. And so I started experimenting with high protein, low carbohydrate diets and had much greater success. And it was much um, uh the, the the owners thanked me quite a bit because their dogs weren't trying to get in the garbage and lick every last bit of food off of the floor. And what I attribute it to is is the fact that you have a high protein diets, it leads to the sense of, of satiation or the sense of being full uh, versus those those kind of lower energy density foods. Uh, you know, they're they're supposed to distend the belly and, and trick the, the body into thinking that it is full that long. And so actually high high meat, low carb diets are are uh, a great option at least when it comes to, to weight loss or 
um, the ma maintaining muscle mass. And the, the last thing I'll, I'll throw in there too is that not only are um, they helpful in, in the weight loss program, but they're also helpful when they're losing weight to help maintain that muscle mass as well. There's plenty of amino acids in these high protein diets to help maintain uh, the, that muscle mass and not essentially going into a state of starvation. So in, some, in summary, high protein diets do not cause kidney disease in dogs or cats. Um, you know, the, the thing that people may be thinking is, well, why is there association with high protein in kidneys? Uh, certainly dogs or cats that have kidney disease or existing kidney disease, feeding a high protein diet would be contraindicated or not advised. Um, and then lastly, I think that high meat, low carb diets are great options when it comes to weight loss and, and main, actually just maintaining weight as well. Well, that was the end of this one. So the setup here is that uh, Square Pet uh, did a little social media campaign and uh, kind of a local social media campaign. And we were looking for dogs to come in and take pictures to uh, potentially be on the front of our packaging. And so we had a photo shoot set up and then I brought BB along and she got to be the little test dog to make sure all the photography settings were all uh, where they needed to be. And she did a great job and she got a, she got a treat afterwards. So everyone was happy. All right, question number four, this should be an interesting one. Do carbohydrates contribute to yeast overgrowth or, or yeast infections? So 42% of the participants believe yes, that they can contribute. 14% said no, and so did 14% said sometimes, but most of the, many of the audience, 28% said not sure. Fantastic. That's a, it's actually the the kind of the breakdown that I was that I was expecting to be honest with you. Um, so I, you know, being in the pet food industry, I have the opportunity to, to kind of travel the country, and I go to a lot of different pet food stores. And this is one. Uh, I would just go out and say it. This is kind of one myth that I hear very commonly. Uh, it doesn't matter West Coast, East Coast, Central, uh, Central part of the part of the U.S. This is something that's that's kind of universally uh, being spread out there, and and. And I never say anything and don't just kind of be respectful and, and not say anything. But given this forum, given this opportunity, I'll, I'll throw my two cents in if, if you don't mind. Overall, what the concept that I'm referring to is, is this right here. And I'm taking this off of the Internet kind of word for word. It's the, the thought that you feed carbohydrates, those that ultimately break down into sugars, those sugars feed the yeast and then the yeast like that and replicate like crazy very very logical it kind of really makes sense and i can see why uh it's kind of it, uh, gain traction is something that gets said a, a, a lot i'll explain here a little bit when we look at dogs uh dogs cats they carry yeast on them naturally uh, healthiest dogs in the world still have yeast on them it's just something that that they have on them they only become an issue the yeast only becomes an issue when the skin gets inflamed, uh, that skin gets nice and moist, gets inflamed, maybe gets a little bit warm, creates a really nice environment for those yeast to start to, to replicate and, and essentially to grow. Uh, and there's no better place, you know, no more perfect place for, for yeast to grow than inside of the ears. ears you can't think of a, a, a better environment, that nice, warm, moist cave of, of the ears for your yeast to replicate. And that's why we see a lot of yeast based ear infections. Um, so we have yeast on the skin, the yeast, the skin gets inflamed. That's what causes the uh, replication of yeast. What causes the, the inflammation? If allergies and in my opinion, it's typically environmental allergies. It can certainly be food allergies. Uh, it could also be if uh, the immune system, you know, dog's not feeling well, their immune system dips down a little bit. Uh, yeast are opportunists. They take advantage of whatever they can. Uh, certainly some medications that you give, steroids, for instance, can lower the immune system, allow the yeast to replicate. Uh, but overall, uh, yeast are living on the skin. When you, the skin gets irritated, the ears get irritated, inflamed, red, uh, allows a perfect environment for those yeast to thrive and uh, and replicate and the cause of that is typically some type of some type of allergy or, or food allergy or immune system de deficiency 
Uh, and so the answer to this is no with a little bit of asterisk. So do carbohydrates contribute, contribute to yeast overgrowth and infection? No. And the asterisk comes from the, the off chance that a carbohydrate ingredient may be causing the food allergy, which typically it's protein ingredients that cause food allergies. It's not unheard of. It's not impossible for a carbohydrate ingredient to cause a food allergy, but it's, it's certainly not the most common thing to do. And I think an exam, a kind of a maybe a visualization of what I immediately thought of when I started hearing this is when we consume food, when dogs consume food, they're eating, even if they eat straight sugar, uh, that's taking place on the inside part of the dog. The yeast are living on the outside part of the dog. How does that sugar get to the outside part of the dog to, to, to be able to facilitate that growth and to feed those yeast? And that's kind of the, the overall take home message, I suppose, with, with that, with that concept. So this would be again, just to prove that she is a, a lab and, and labs like water. Okay. Uh, potentially controversial one here. Um, are high glycemic carbohydrates bad? So according to the poll, it looks like about 70% say yes and 30% say it depends on your pet. Perfect answers. And that's actually what, what I was anticipating. And, and you know, the, the way I'm setting this, this thing up, I, it's not a proponent of high glycemic carbs. What I'm trying to do is that um, even in the human world, uh, we get a lot of advertising focused in our direction about high glycemic carbs, spiking blood sugar. Uh, we just have this association with them being bad. Um, and I'm just here to kind of point out a couple of other considerations when it comes to the pet food world. Uh, so before we dive in, uh, just to kind of get everyone up to speed on what kind of glycemic even means, the thought of, of low glycemic versus high glycemic. Uh, high glycemic carbohydrates are ones that are thought to spike the, the blood sugar right after they're consumed, whereas low glycemic carbohydrates are ones that aren't are thought to not spike the, the blood sugar after after being consumed and really the way i like to think about it is well what causes them to spike um and one what, what causes one kind of carb to spike versus the other one not to spike and it breaks down into digestibility when we look at high glycemic carbs those are tend to be really easy to digest uh they release their sugar well we'll just call it for the sake of this conversation, we'll call it sugar. They release their sugar into the bloodstream. Uh, it rises, uh, potentially rises uh, straight away. Although there are some studies that show that that dogs fed high glycemic carbs don't necessarily have the same spike as what humans do. Uh, anyway, with the low glycemic carbs, they're a little bit more difficult to digest. Uh, they might have incomplete digestion. You might not digest all the way. And so that's why it's not releasing all that sugar into the, uh, into the bloodstream. So a couple of considerations. We're probably all thinking, hey, high glycemics are not good at all. Um, that's what we've been kind of conditioned. Uh, but here's some condition, some considerations to kind of just think about. Uh, the fact that low glycemic carbs are low glycemic because they're hard to digest. Uh, what are some, some potential downsides to that? Well, as I mentioned before, they're, they don't digest all that well. So you might have incomplete digestion. That bowl full of chickpeas that uh, your dog's consuming might not get digested all the way to the essentially throughout the whole GI tract. Uh, we well know what happens when we eat a lot of beans. Uh, when dogs eat a lot of beans, uh, those are low glycemic carbs. Uh, those can cause flatulence and, and gas and, and those types of things. And then there's some some notions and I don't have any data to back this up, but they potentially could possibly possibly interfere with the absorption of, of, of other nutrients that are that are being digested. And that's the thought of some of these lower glycemic carbs have a lot of fiber. Um, that fiber can interfere with uh, with digestion, in addition to the indigestible components of of the the carbohydrate itself. So that's one consideration. Um, and I think this kind of gets hammered home when when we as vets, you know, recommend a bland diet. You know, we don't really recommend sending someone home and, and say, hey, home cook a, a a bowl full of boiled chicken and, and chickpeas. Uh, we typically recommend, hey, go do some boiled chicken and rice. And, and the reason for that rice is really, really digestible. So uh, we want we want something that's probably higher glycemic than, than something that's lower glycemic. 
the concept of glycemic index versus glycemic load. So essentially the glycemic index is whether or not it's a high glycemic carb or a low glycemic carb. carb. And then the glycemic load essentially is what's the total carbohydrate content. And I'm talking about complete doubt complete diets. So what's the total amount of carbohydrates in a diet? So what I'm going to do is compare two diets. Uh, one that does contain high glycemic carbs. This one contains potatoes. This cup is intended to represent the total amount of carbohydrates. That's what the blue part, the blue bar is within that cup. Uh, and so that's the total carbohydrate concentration of high glycemic, you know, call it a high glycemic diet diet versus diets that are advertised to be made with low glycemic carbohydrates. Uh, they made, they, they are made with a lot of low glycemic carbohydrates. And so which one's better, uh, the low glycemic carbs that, that make up 50 or 40% of the diet or a diet that contains a high glycemic carb that has very small amount. Uh, it's kind of a, a nutritional philosophy kind of question in which personal preference and all those kind of things, again, not making any judgments here, but just pointing out some considerations when we look at high glycemic carbs. Uh, one that that is a little bit of a pet peeve to me is the notion that uh, we feed uh, with the, the promoting the fact or trying to promote the fact that uh, if we feed low glycemic carbs, that dogs won't get diabetes and the association between diet and body condition and obesity and dogs getting diabetes. And that's just not true at all. Uh, dogs. And this is where where a lot of times you can't translate human nutrition into canine nutrition and dogs overwhelmingly do not get type 2 diabetes the overwhelming majority of them get type 1 uh, which is uh, in, is either inherited genetic causes sometimes immune causes and you don't have to take my word for it there are studies out there that have shown the no published data showing that over type 2 diabetes occurs in dogs that or that obesity is a risk factor for canine diabetes. So essentially, the fact that a dog is overweight, a dog, the fact that a dog's on a high glycemic carbohydrate, a carbohydrate-laden diet, or any kind of diet, isn't going to predispose them to getting uh, diabetes. And so, when we look at diabetes, is the preference to feed a diet that's you know full of low glycemic carbs, or or diets full of high glycemic carbs, in the the vacuum of of diabetes? It doesn't make a difference because not, 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 neither one of them is going to prevent uh, the onset of diabetes in, in this case. When we look at cats, cats are, however, not small dogs. Cats can absolutely get diabetes from, uh, and I say from diet, but from their, their body condition. Obese cats can develop uh, diabetes more similar to how humans do as well. And so we recommend uh, high protein, low carb diets for, for kitty cats. I think this is the last slide on this one. Uh, just another consideration. Uh, if we have a dog that is just running like crazy, a super active dog that's just nonstop, go, 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 working dog, service dog, it's probably not a bad thing to have high glycemic carbs in there to provide that ready source of energy. Those things digest quickly, uh, provide that, again, that ready source of energy. Uh, when we look at some, some of the veterinary diets, like di digestive support diets are a great, great example. Uh, kind of one of the reasons why we recommend boiled chicken and, and rice, uh, that rice provides that ready source of energy uh, directly to that, that intestine, that gut, to the stomach that may be inflamed, it may be damaged and in, in, in need of some, some nutritional support or energy. Uh, and again, be kind of easily digestible, uh, great for those sensitive stomachs and, and that kind of thing. So uh, I think that the, the folks that, that responded, it kind of just depends on the diet. You know, I absolutely agree. Uh, there's no there's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, it's just a, a consideration of, I think, the total amount of carbohydrate concentration that a diet contains is really the big question. Um, and so the answer, are high glycemic carbs bad? No. Uh, the asterisk is, is if a dog does have diabetes, cat does have diabetes, that being high glycemic carbs or carbo carbohydrate laden foods in general, that high glycemic load, probably not a good idea, uh, contraindicated. And, and uh, we like to advocate for high meat, low carbohydrate diets in this situation as well. So uh, baby's friend text, they found the smallest stick that they could to try and uh, play keep away with. They have a good old time together. 
Question six, I think this is the second to last question here. Will any limited ingredient diet help pets with food allergies? All right, so it looks like uh, a third say yes, a third say no, and a few say it depends on the diet. Uh, some diets help and some are not sure. Uh, yeah, again, it's uh, it's kind of a strangely worded question. I take take fault on that because it's it's very ambiguous. Uh, it really depends on what the what the situation is. Uh, but when we look at limited ingredient diets and and um, you know what what's the intent of of providing a limited ingredient diet? And in the veterinary world, I refer to them as as elimination diets. And what's the goal? Uh, well, what we're trying to do is to try and eliminate any offending ingredients or any ingredients that are potentially causing an allergic reaction or some kind of uh, food intolerance. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is to limit the total number of ingredients. Uh, just helps us to weed out which one's potentially causing the trouble. And the third one is something that I think gets overlooked a lot. Um, and it goes back to our conversations about high glycemic versus low glycemic is to make it highly digestible. There's some dogs out there that maybe have a food sensitivity or food allergy, uh, but they also have a food intolerance that they just, and that what that means is, is that they have trouble di digesting certain ingredients, uh, but they're not having that allergic reaction to them. And so if we just whittle down the amount of ingredients, make them really highly digestible, gives us a best chance for success in identifying what kind of diet would work for, for, for uh, each individual dog that's maybe having an issue. Uh, and so, again, just trying to grab a few different diets here to point out what we feel are, are the targets for limited ingredient diets. Certainly having a single uh, source protein is a very important. So this example here, lamb, lamb meal, that's great. One, one single source protein. Uh, then we get down, we have four or five different carbohydrate ingredients. Again, carbohydrates probably aren't going to be a big deal when it comes to allergic reactions. It's the protein ingredients that usually cause the problems. But again, we want to try and tighten up that deck, as, uh, that ingredient panel as much as possible. Uh, and then we also have, you know, chickpeas and lentils and millet, you know, not known to be great, uh, highly digestible. They are low glycemic carbohydrates. Uh, so not necessarily, probably not the best digestibility there. So we go to, to example two. Well, we got lamb. That's great. Single source protein. But we go down the list a little bit. And actually, you know, we break down into pea protein and alfalfa meal. Those are actually concentrated protein sources. And, you know, it's a bit nitpicky, uh, but can be a con contrib contributor to uh, uh, essentially food allergies. Uh, we have a single source car uh, carb, which is great. Uh, so we have a pretty nice looking looking panel here as far as limited ingredients. But then it's really common that I'll, I'll go through and see a lot of uh, limited ingredient diets and um, you know, have really nice looking starts to their diets. And then all of a sudden they start adding in a bunch of cranberries and blueberries and all kinds of other things that that have great label presence, but uh, really are contra. Uh, they're contrary to the philosophy of what a limited ingredient diet is to just really limit down the number of ingredients. I think in our mind, what, what we feel is a great limited ingredient diet is one, a single source protein. If it could be a novel protein, meaning that it's something that has a, a dog hasn't been exposed to. So venison is really a, a great option, duck, rabbit, those types of things. Uh, one or two carbohydrate ingredients, uh, carbohydrate, carbohydrate ingredients that, that, that tend to be more digestible um, and just really limiting down the, the total number of ingredients uh, overall. And so the thought, at least from our nutritional philosophy, what's the goal of the limited ingredient diet? Single source protein, sometimes a novel protein is indicated or preferred. Uh, one or two carbohydrate sources max and making it highly digestible and then very few overall ingredients. And that's the thing that I'd say to look out for is there's a lot of limited ingredient diets out there that have 20 ingredients in there. And I don't see why they're called limited ingredient diets anyway. So uh, keep that, that ingredient list short. So with that, our little dog, BB is really a sweet little girl and she's really good. Uh, she does have a tendency to get in the garbage and she got into the pantry when we left and ate all of the kids' uh, single serving Pringles cans. I'm sure she, I know she really enjoyed those. <laughs>
All right, last question. I know this is a, a, a really, it's gonna be a really, really rap, rapid one, quick one to answer. Um, so is kibble needed for good dental hygiene? I think I know where the answers are gonna lie with this one. All right, so according to the poll, 62%, about two thirds of our guests think the answer is no. 25% uh, said yes. And a few people are not sure. Sure. You know, I, I, if I'm honest, I was a little bit surprised. I thought that overwhelming majority of people would say that, uh, no, just say no. Uh, there are some kibble diets out there that are designed for oral health. They have, uh, um, uh, I'm going to blank on the name of it right now, but it's essentially a chemical that helps break down tartar on the teeth. And so uh, this this is the, my comment here. My answer to this is, is worth my comparison. You cannot... You cannot replace legitimate in-hospital dental cleanings versus any kind of food substance, whether it's treats, chews, bones, whatever. I hear a lot of anecdotal reports of, of uh, well, you know, this particular diet. I, I never had to take my dog to the vet to get his teeth cleaned because this diet, you know, cleans his teeth all the time. And, you know, that may be very much the truth for a certain segment of the population, probably a small segment. Uh, but I think that has a lot to do with the genetics of that dog. Uh, you can't replace going in and getting a dental cleaning. And the reason why is that all these food substances that are potentially cleaning the teeth uh, are just are abrasive in nature. And they may be cleaning the visual portion of the teeth, the tooth that you can see, but they're not doing anything to get below that gum line and get down in that bacteria and clean out the tartar that's accumulating down below the gum, gum line. And when we look at uh, humans, for instance, you know, we go to the dentist. Uh, my wife's a dental hygienist. She's cleaned our dog's teeth a couple of times and used the same equipment, same instruments that, that the, the veterinary, veterinary veterinarians do uh, to allow us to get below that gum line and actually really clean things up. So uh, overall, can, can certain food ingredients, certain foods uh, promote, uh, uh, point us in the direction of good oral health? Absolutely. But the bottom line is you can't replace going in and getting, getting, a, uh, getting a dental cleaning. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, for hopping on this evening. Again, my thanks to, to Cherry Brook for allowing us this opportunity. And uh, Greg, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. I think there might be some, some questions that we're going to try and attempt to answer. That's true. Yep. All right. So first question is, um, can you discuss some good food or for foods that are good for dogs diagnosed with pancreatitis? So I guess in, in absolutely happy to uh, just as a little bit of a disclaimer um, with making recommendations on my my behalf right now as a as a veterinarian I need a, a, a valid veterinary client patent patient relationship essentially a relationship in order to make specific advice and so when it comes to questions like this I'm going to talk in generalities and so when we talk about pancreatitis uh, the most typical diet. Uh, dietary management, the most recommended uh, diet for the management of pancreatitis is, a, again, a highly digestible diet that is guaranteed to be low in fat. And there's a lot of low fat diets that are out there. Um, but the dis distinguishing thing between, let's say, a square pet low fat formula and even some of the veterinary therapeutic diets is that we uh, we put a cap on the amount of fat that are in these diets. So they're guaranteed not to come, ac come above a certain amount. And that's where I work with the board certified veterinary nutritionist to, to identify where that level should be so that we don't exceed it. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that separates out uh, those, you know, our low fat formula the therapeutic diets from the over the counter diets is that the other, other low fat formulas just guarantee, typically guarantee a minimum amount. And so you really don't know where that fat level's um, actually floating because um, you need a maximum amount, uh, a guaranteed maximum amount. So low fat diets that are highly digestible would be a great place to start. Uh, next question. Uh, Seth wants to know what is a good percentage for protein in a dry food? I guess he's referring to kibble. Yeah, that's a great question too. So it, 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 to me, we promote life stage feeding. So is it a puppy? I tend to lean towards a higher protein diet. Um, actually on the, on the senior end of things, I recommend a, a higher protein diet too. Uh, are we active? Are we inactive? Um, you know, if, if we're, if we're out, out of the puppy stage, we definitely need to be, uh, if we're below the puppy stage, excuse me, we definitely need to be 22% protein and higher. Um, 
I'll, I'll give you an example of our, our all life stages, high meat, low carb diet. It's around 42% protein uh, with less than 14% carbohydrates. Uh, really palatable. It's a great place to start with a puppy. And then you kind of uh, just get uh, an assessment of what the life stage is, what the activity is. And, and really it's a, it's kind of fine tuning what those needs are. Okay. Uh, Patricia wants to know what's the best diet for bladder stones in dogs. Okay, great. Uh, again, kind of a general, general recommendation. We look at the, uh, the urinary style diets that are intended to, help dissolve those stones. And this is something I would absolutely advocate speaking with your veterinarian about, but typically those diets, what they do is, is modify the urinary pH and they essentially make the dog consumes the diet, it gets metabolized, goes, works its way down and, and uh, into the, into the urine, into the bladder, uh, that urine gets acidified and depending on the stone type, but the most common ones, true bite stone, and depending on the size of that stone, it actually can dissolve. Um, and then you try and maintain that urine pH at a lower amount so that they don't uh, aren't predisposed to, to uh, getting those stones again. So essentially a diet that modifies the urinary pH uh, would be my most general answer. Uh, Jennifer's lab keeps getting yeast infections between his toes. Uh, she wonders if it's his diet. A great question. I think about, um, you know, the first two things that come come to mind is uh, either is and it is usually what comes to all veterinarians' minds. Is it is it food related or is it is it environmental allergies? And I'd be interested to know if there's if there's ear infections as well, or if it's just isolated to the to the paws. Um, I would also want to know if, if it could be a contact allergy. If it's just isolated to the paws, is it something that we may be walking on that's causing causing some allergies to those? Um, and so it's, it's, it, it certainly could be a food allergy, but it's really tough to say just based off of those, the, that clinical sign. Okay, we'll see if she adds to that. Uh, Lee first wants to know what is a, what do you recommend for an overweight dog that always appears to be hungry, always begging? She comments um, it's, a, it's a Maltese apparently. Got it. Yeah. Um, you know, again, a kind of a general blanket statement, my go-to for weight loss diets are high meat, low carbohydrate diets. As kind of mentioned before, the alternative style of diet are those diets that are, are really maybe even low in fat, uh, high in carbohydrates, have a lot of fiber. The thought is that uh, that fiber amount is supposed to stay in the belly and, and, and cause distension, right? They're actually what they're, the thought is, is that they can eat more quantity of that lower calorie diet and it makes their stomach distended. Um, in my experience, those haven't been the greatest ones, and I've always leaned on high meat, low carbohydrate diets. You know, you'd be surprised at the small amount that you actually have to feed. Um, I guess another way to say it, and, and I don't know if this analogy ever translates that well, but I think about if you have uh, us as humans, if you go out and eat equal equal plates, I have one plate here, one plate here, equal parts, you know, steak, and then equal parts Chinese food, and, and typically I feed, I stay fuller a lot longer after I eat a steak, then I do Chinese food. And it's kind of that same philosophy, at least in my mind. Uh, next question. Do you count vitamins and minerals as added limited, uh, as added to limited ingredient diets uh, as ingredients? That's a great, that's a phenomenal question. And no, I, I, I do not. Uh, typically I'm looking at the core drivers of the formula. So your proteins and your carbohydrates, uh, I don't even count natural flavors as, as an ingredient. I'm just counting the, the core components of the, um, and then also depends on the oil, but I, I typically don't count, count the oil as well. Okay. Uh, Beth wants to know what's a good food for a Labrador retriever. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, I happen to be extremely biased in my ability to respond to this question right now. Uh, I have a Labrador Retriever and I feed her square pet. I feed her either a combination of our active joints formula, even though she doesn't have any joint disease. I just like that it has elevated amounts of DHA, EPA, and it's a higher protein diet. And then I also feed her our, our square pet turkey and chicken diet, which is a high protein, low carb diet. Okay. Uh, next question. If you're feeding a raw or frozen, uh, frozen bones, would you still need to do uh, dental cleanings? You know, I, again, it, it, my comment is, um, and, and that's probably the one thing that I hear most commonly is if any dogs being fed raw, uh, don't need dental, dental, dental cleanings. And, and I'm sure there's dogs out there that have great oral health hygiene. 
Um, I don't, I personally don't think that any food that we, that a dog will eat is going to get down below that gum line and, and clean that, clean up the, the bacteria and the plaque that's accumulating. And so you can't replace any food for, for a, a proper dental cleaning. Um, Wendy wants to know, do you recommend wet food? I do. I do. Uh, you know, everything's in moderation, but especially for cats, I love wet food. Um, I look at wet food uh, for certain conditions. Certainly, if we have kidney disease or kidney issues, wet food is paramount. Uh, dogs that maybe aren't prone to drinking a lot of water uh, love wet food. Um, and don't be surprised if you do introduce wet food into your dog's diet if they don't, their water bowl doesn't fill up uh, or doesn't decrease as much. Uh, wet food is, you know, sometimes 80% water, uh, 75 to 80% water. And so they're getting a lot of hydration through their, through their wet food. But yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Tanya wants to know, do you recommend any uh, or have any advice for a dog with kidney stones? Any food advice for a dog with kidney, uh, kidney disease? So, uh, so kind of a general response for uh, kidney disease. What we're looking for are three kind of core dietary uh, uh, attributes, if you will, or core tenants. And again, recommend running this by your personal veterinarian, uh, getting these things uh, dialed in to, to what suits your, your individual dog. But in general, we think about uh, dietary management of, management of kidney disease, uh, low phosphorus, low protein, and then low sodium. And those are the three things that we're looking for for, uh, for essentially kidney disease in, in dogs and cats. Okay. All right, uh, Heidi says, Due to having an autoimmune syndrome, my dog needs to rebuild muscle and put weight on. How do you do this with high protein, high fat? Is it easy to digest carbs? Uh, so if we're if 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 I summarize that is it sounds like we have a issue maintaining weight, um, and so just like humans, what we want to do is is try and add as many calories in as possible. Uh, the the easiest way to do that is get a, a really energy dense formula, uh, energy dense food. Uh, majority of your energy is going to come from fat um, and then protein and carbohydrates should make up make up the rest of it. But I would recommend a high pro high protein, high fat diet, assuming there's no issues with the pancreas or any other conditions, but something that's just really energy dense um, and just decrease, increase the feeding amounts. Okay, uh, Kathy wants to know, is coconut oil bad for dogs? since it's high in saturated fats? I, I personally don't think so. You start to see a lot of co coconut oil. I think, again, it depends on on the, uh, you know, the, the inclusion rate that, that coconut's included in, and I'm not the world's expert on, on coconut oil. Uh, I know that it has uh, MCTs um, and that there's some omega-9s, some other uh, fatty acids that can be beneficial to health, but I don't I don't get concerned about feeding coconut oil. Uh, Amy wants to know, what's the best source of omega-3? Some say fish oil can go rancid, for example, looking at uh, plant alternatives like phytoplankton or flaxseed, et cetera. Yeah, uh, great, a fabulous question. Uh, my two favorite sources of, of DHA, EPA, and that's something that we hammer home throughout of all of our diets. Uh, they're so beneficial for a lot of different ways from uh, from from cognitive de cognitive development in puppies to the anti-inflammatory uh, uh, benefits in, in joint disease and also in, in digestive support. So we're big fans. I'm a huge fan of omega threes. Uh, we tend to get our omega threes from both of those sources. So fish based sources uh, like menhaden oil, salmon oil, uh, and then also from from algae sources. Uh, they're really great pure sources of of, of DHA. In particular, not so much EPA, but DHA. I guess it depends on the type of allergy. Mm -hmm. uh, DHA, and then you're getting your EPA from uh, from your fish oils. Uh, quick comment on flaxseed. That's a really big. That's a that's a great question and kind of another little pet peeve of, of mine that flaxseed gets included in a lot of diets because it is a source of omega threes, uh, but it's not the type of omega three that's going to convert into that DHA or EPA, which is really the most beneficial portion of those omega threes or those long chain uh, fatty acids. So, flaxseed's great, no, no problem with it, but it's not it's not giving us uh, it's not giving us any of that DHA and EPA. So, fish oils and and algae sources. Okay, next question: um, Should large breed dogs be fed a joint formula as a preventative? 
you know, unless you have some family history, um, you know, you know, the mother, the brother, you know, has, has a history of joint disease. I don't think that it's necessary at all. Um, is, is there anything that's going to be harmful to it? Absolutely not. As I mentioned, I'm feeding my two year old to a little over two year old lab, a joint formula. And it's more from the, the standpoint of it has some great DHA, MA, EPA, uh, uh amounts inside of it. So uh, I, I, is it indicated? Probably not. Is there anything wrong with it? Definitely not. Uh, Wendy has a great dean with chronic diarrhea. Any suggestions on food? He does have sensitive stomach and itchy skin. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's a tough one to answer. It, it'd be nice to have a little more information. You know, how long has it been going on? What's the characteristic of it? You know, is it small amounts frequently or is it, does it have any blood in there? Are there any, any, any other distinguishing characteristics of the diarrhea itself? Um, you know, how long has this been going on? Um, when I think about if we're just talking about a, a dog that, that has a short-term upset stomach, got in the garbage, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, has maybe fluctuating intermittent diarrhea, I, I turn towards, you know, uh, uh, diets that are highly digestible, uh, diets that have uh, balanced fiber sources, and then I look towards prebiotics and probiotics would kind of be my my go-to for, for, for that particular situation. So she just added that he's had it his whole life. Oh, interesting. And I'd be interested to know if there's any other health conditions uh, that are associated with him. Does he have any other pre-existing, I guess, conditions? Uh, has he been worked up? Has he had blood work, labs, uh, x-rays, biopsies of any kind? Uh, all right, next question. Uh, can you recommend a good food brand for a Yorkie? Uh, you know, I guess it, it's, again, extremely biased from my standpoint. We do we do favor square pet diets. Uh, just in talking about, I'll, I'll focus on Yorkie nutrition, I guess, in more, more, more or less small breed nutrition. Uh, what we want to pay attention to is, is, is making sure these puppies get uh, get enough energy. Uh, we want to feed them small amounts frequently throughout the day uh, when they're really, really young and then move that up to three to four times a day or decrease that down to three, four, three to four times a day until they're you know, getting close to fully grown. And then you can get into whatever fits best in your schedule and what's best for the dog as far as your schedule goes and what, how they're concerned, how they're doing, uh, but typically two to three times a day once they become an adult. So um, certainly we have I favor our, our high meat, low carb diet for, for puppies. Um, it's a really energy dense formula and, and um, it has a, a long history of feeding extremely well. Okay. Uh, Deb wants to know, do you have any uh, experience working with goat products? I'm sorry, with, with goat? Goat products, yeah, I guess I'm referring to goat milk. I, I really don't, I really don't. Okay. Uh, is there any diets for dogs with congestive heart failure? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's not like a heart diet. Um, one of the things, some of the things, again, speaking in generalities, and I'd consult with your veterinarian or your veterinary cardiologist with this, but um, uh, as, a, as a side note, that's kind of how we partially developed our active joints diet uh, was to be reduced sodium. Uh, when you have congestive heart failure, uh, typically it's a result of one of your valves not working, you're, you're getting fluid building up in the chest. And so you're trying to decrease blood pressure as much as possible. And sometimes uh, lowering the sodium in, in, in the diet can be uh, helpful. It's not going to be the solve all, but it can be helpful in that, in that uh, uh, combination of therapy. So um, higher protein diets are also potentially beneficial, uh, something that's a little more uh, energy dense. Uh, we think about dogs that, that have congestive heart failure, they tend to lose weight because they're not, you know, they're not really feeling great. So they're not eating a lot. So higher protein helps them to maintain their muscle mass and then reducing that sodium down, uh, could, would be a place to start at least. Okay. So Travis, we're just about out of time for tonight. We have one more question we're going to take here. Is there a diet that a dog with pancreatitis and a dog with bladder stones could both eat? I'm assuming that the owner has oh. a kind of simplify diets in the household gosh that's a tough one not there's not one that comes to mind i know that we don't offer offer one um what i would look for is to consult with your vet and to look in the veterinary therapeutic handbooks and to see which one of those diets uh, that are urinary specific potentially has a low enough fat for you to 
that, that might be a, a passing for pancreatitis. And I can only hope that it, it's one that, uh, that we're not requiring such a restricted fat level. That's something that's in the, in the lower percentages of uh, fat can, can help. But that's, I know there might be one for urinary. It's really tough in the, in the kidney diets, but the urinary ones, there might be, there might be an option. All right. Well, thank you so much, Travis. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, we have been recording this program, so we will be posting this uh, recording to our website and sending this out, a link to this by email, so you can share this with any friends or revisit the uh, topics if you'd like to. Uh, we really appreciate your time tonight, and we hope you had a great time. Thank you so much, Travis. Great. Thank you all. Thank you very much.